head into the Ringerverse to stay up to date with all things superheroes and nerd culture entertainment. Hosted by a rotating lineup of superfans at the Ringer, including Mallory Rubin and Van Lathan, shows will provide instant reactions to blockbuster releases, insightful backstories on canon, and mind-bending theories, as well as fresh takes on the latest news and rumors. Check out the Ringerverse on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. All right, it's official. I think I've discovered the ultimate coupling of all time. Like any good relationship, they really balance each other out. One is super sweet, and the other, well, they can be a little nutty sometimes. It is, of course, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. So perfect, some would call it true love. Find Reese's now at a store near you. This episode is brought to you by eBay Authenticity Guarantee eBay knows that when it comes to jewelry, authenticity is the real gem. When you see the blue check mark that says authenticity guarantee, it means your next piece will be carefully inspired by jewelry experts and will always be worth its weight in gold. Whether you're looking to make a statement or build the perfect everyday look, eBay is making sure you get the real deal. With eBay authenticity guarantee, you can trust that jaw-dropping piece will always arrive jaw-droppingly real. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal. Visit ebay.com for terms. Welcome to Bachelor Party. It's the B-side. I am joined today by Miss Penny Lane from, well, she's been on this podcast, and she is the director of listening to Kenny G, which premieres tonight on HBO and HBO Max. Penny, welcome back. Woo woo. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you. I'm going to be honest. I had no thoughts or relationship about Kenny G, like really ever. And then I saw your film and I now talk about him all the time. And I loved the film. I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't have asked you to come back. But I, I just like it was it's so great. I loved it. Thank you. I can't wait for everyone to see it. I'm really, really intrigued to hear like the reactions of the masses once it's out. Well, like I didn't rec- I didn't realize that Kenny G was like so f- insanely popular. One of the things the film does really well is like actually capture the extremely wide audience of Kenny G fans. I mean, it's shocking. Did you know that when you pitched it, the idea? Yeah, pretty much like my pitch was like, almost everyone on this planet loves Kenny G. <laughs> that, like, the, why? Like, that was the question. And then, like, why do, why is this, like, sort of smaller, very much smaller population of people quite bothered by that success and, right. um, you know, adoration of the masses? <laughs> it's really bizarre. But I had a few takeaways from the film, but one of them that's relevant right now is I'm like, how has Kenny G never been on The Bachelor? As you, sh- as you... <laughs> made it clear in the film. You really should be. So maybe I know. we can work on that. I know. If anyone's listening, pull pull some strings, Juliet. I think it would be amazing. <laughs> Do you think Kenny G watches reality television? No, he doesn't watch anything but golf. That's nuts. All right. Like when he Whatever. like when he like watched when he says he watched my previous film, Hail Satan, like he means he watched the first 10 minutes. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> I watched it and I was like, cool. What'd you think? He's like, yeah, well, I watched the first 10 minutes. It was great. And I was like, <laughs> all right, cool. Like he, he doesn't like he has like no hobbies beyond like the things that he does, which is golf, flying his plane, investing in the stock market, practicing the saxophone. That's pretty much it. I thought you were about to say practicing sex. I like for the way that you said saxophone. I was like, oh my God, Kenny G. <laughs> um, well, everyone watched the film. And the reason that you are here today, though, is because you're a big Bachelor fan yourself. And you am do, wa- do watch a lot of reality TV. Spoiler alert. We're going to talk about Selling Sunset because you told me you watched all of it. And I'm really excited. But first, let's talk about hometowns. First of all, Penny, who's your favorite of these four dudes? We got Rodney, Brandon, oh. Nate, and Joe. <laughs> and I, I'll just tell you, I, I'm very, as I say every week now, I'm, I'm in the bag for Nate. I just think he's incredibly <laughs> hot, but I know he's not the right choice. However, I'm curious who <gasps> wow. you like. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I am blown away right now on so many levels. Yes. Interesting. I think Nate is like, the red flags. Like, yeah. I feel like that's his nickname. <laughs> like, what's his last name? Nate red flags, last name. Like, wow. I was going to say Rodney was my favorite. And I was devastated so when Rodney went home. I was 
devastated and frankly shocked. And I, I can't believe this, Were this you franchise. Yes, I can't believe this franchise continues to shock, you know, have the ability to shock me. Like nothing should shock me. I've been watching this show for 20 years. But I was like genuinely like, Michelle, why would you choose <laughs> Nate over Rodney? Like I was like so upset about it. I couldn't believe how upset I was. It was well, brutal. It was very clear to me she was going to choose Nate and Joe. Like that's obvious. Number well, one, Joe, yeah, one obviously. I wasn't sure about Brandon, I guess. I, I, I That's yeah. what I found shocking. Choosing Rodney, choosing Brandon over Rodney, I don't understand. I really don't get get. Brandon, like the appeal of him, Callie, who's on the show with me on Tuesdays, like she likes Brandon. Um, but I just don't get it. And and that's what I actually was found, found shocking. It's just like Brandon just seems so young. I can't get over it. He seems so young. I think the reason he seems so young is that he has gigantic earrings that are like, you know, <laughs> um, cr- like crystally, <laughs> like they're like very blingy. And then I was super psyched to realize his brother has the same exact earrings. And I was like, got it. <laughs> like That's the whole thing. <laughs> I loved his brother's style, actually. I have very similar clear glasses from Warby Parker. I thought he looked very hip. Be- better style than Brandon, that's for sure. Oh, I agree. But he had the same earrings, which for me is a real no-go. <laughs> Well, if you don't like earrings, maybe that's why you don't like Nate. He's Mr. Mr. Jo- Jules. Jo- I know, I know, I know. Well, you know, it's always a thing with the bachelor, bachelorette. Like, you have to grapple with, like, your taste in romantic partners and how everyone has a different, you know, sure. thing that they're looking for. So. I think this show, for me, makes me confront many of my worst impulses, like being into Nate. Like, I'm just like, uh, I know <laughs> Nate is the wrong choice. <laughs> I was going to say like, yeah, no, I was going to say, so I'm not into Nate like personally, but I get like the idea of the wrong person. Like, of course I always choose the wrong person. Why do I watch The Bachelorette? Probably because I've always chosen the wrong person. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Whose family was the most surprising to you? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I guess Nate's family. Like I was Mm -hmm. kind of like intrigued with this like we've never talked about our feelings ever in this household thing until ABC brought cameras in. (laughs) And then we had this like romantic heart, not romantic, but like heartfelt, like heart to heart, stepdad, son convo, which is very moving. Like I was like really, really, it was beautiful, but it was, I was, I was a little like intrigued. I was kind of like, I want to know more about this. Like how has Nate never talked about anything emotional with anyone in that house ever. I know because it's a good point because there's, there's two things there. One, I do kind of understand not talking about like relationships, like and not wanting to, you know, open that up unless you know, it's really serious and, and whatever, but not talking about feelings at all. That seems to be like a theme of this season. A lot of these guys are like, I don't talk about feelings. My dad doesn't talk about feelings or whatnot. And that's, that is surprising to me. I mean, maybe that's also like I'm from a, a home where, talking about feelings, anxiety, and therapy is like as common (laughs) as breathing. So (laughs) I, I, it's definitely really different. And, um, you know, it it might be a a hyper local type of culture that I, that I represent, but I thought that that part was really surprising as well. And I don't know, it's just, it's been coming up this whole season. It has. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's pretty common on the bachelorette that like, at least one of the front runners is someone the bachelorette has to like teach how to have and express feelings, which is again, like as someone who has been into that, I can't say like, <laughs> Oh, why would she do that? You know, in the, the way that like with Joe, where she was like, he's come a long way. Like he's like a kindergartner and she's like so proud of him because he like talked about his feelings once. That makes me very uncomfortable and sad. <laughs> makes me very sad. <laughs> I, I talked about this on Tuesday as well. I feel like we're not getting the full Joe picture. I'm just like, what? What's going on with yeah. this dude? Help me out. Like, first of all, remind me because I meant to look this up before we hopped on. Is he the one that like ghosted her on yes. like? Yes. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, he didn't respond to her, and he said it was because he got caught up. But everything with that story actually doesn't quite add up because then she also said like that they had messaged a while back, like several years ago, that would have only been Mm. one year ago. And he also said on this episode, he never had a girlfriend. And I, I found that shocking. I I couldn't understand that. That could be true. Maybe that's just me being weird, but there's just feels like we're not getting the full Joe story. I don't understand. How old is Joe? He's 27. He's 27? Okay, yeah. now I'm, my mind is blown. That does not How make any sense. How old did you sense. think he was? 
I don't know, 22. How old's <laughs> Nate? Um, Nate is 28 or 29. They're about the same age. What? Oh my God. This is horrifying. <laughs> is this like a generational thing? These like 28 year old men have never talked about their feelings or had a girlfriend. Like what <laughs> planet are these people on? Is this a young people thing though? Like I heard somewhere that young people aren't dating so much anymore. Really? Yeah, I heard that. They're the also pandemic? not having sex. No, no. They're also not having a lot of sex. I've heard that part too, which I also... Mm. Well, when I say like, dating, I mean having sex, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they don't have to go together. There's many people who would attest to that. Um, but is that a pandemic thing or is that just like cultural? No, before that. Like, yeah, oh. just like big, bigger trend than that. So I don't know if I'm right. I certainly heard that a couple of times. Huh. But yeah, it's o- very odd to me. I these like uh, very attractive, like... Me so too. are they saying that they're like playboys to use an old fashioned wor- word? Is that kind of the vibe? Like, I think that's Nate's vibe. Don't you? Yeah. But I don't think it's Joe's vibe. I honestly, I find think jo- so. I mm. find Joe so confusing. I don't, I don't understand. And it seemed like his brother was shy too. But he's so handsome that like, you yes. don't, you don't, I can get that you just wouldn't care. Like we've all been there. Like the, the force of someone's physical attractiveness can make you overlook 10,000 red flags, which is clearly what's going on Tell with me about Nate it. and Joe, in my opinion. <laughs> like, when I was like making notes on this episode, I wrote, uh-oh, when, it, when she went to Joe's and then it went to Nate's and I was like, uh-oh, and like huge letters and <laughs> underlined it a hundred times. I was like, oh, I thought Joe's hometown was red flaggy. Oh boy. What, what about it? What were the oh, red flags the, for you? The fact that the only person who would speak is the sister-in-law. sister-in-law. <laughs> The sister-in-law saying the men in this family tend to shut down when they have feelings was very um, concerning to me. I know. If someone in the family is telling you that, you got to walk away, right? Like, how how do you stick around for that? I don't know. I mean, I guess you can say, like, I'm fine with someone who tends to shut down. But, like, are you? Are you? Like, is anyone fine with that? Since communication tends to be like such a sticking point in most relationships, as it should be, so much of life is communication. If there is no communication, how are you going to make that last as a for marriage? I mean, it's yeah. What are you going to do when you have a problem? Like what? Hello? Like what? I also think we, you know, we've like learned about Joe's central trauma, but I just feel like there's so many other details about him that we haven't gotten. Obviously, this happens every season but I'm just positive. We're not getting the whole story. I feel like he was like painted into this athlete injury trauma persona with that doesn't tell the whole story at all. And he just seems like he doesn't know how to like give it to the camera, which again, that's okay, but probably needs like more directing and producing. Oh, 1000%. Let's talk about the dates. You know, I mean, talk about like needing a little push. Joe got like a date that Michelle described as the most romantic (laughs) date of all time. Um, you know, as compared to like what, like skateboarding and falling down, like <laughs> looking for an apple, like what, the, sk- <laughs> the, the skateboarding was really painful, really it painful. So, it made me really like him though. Cause it was so embarrassing. Like I was like, this is great. Um, but yeah, so Joe gets this like, you know, fairy tale, like, you know, romantic date. They've given him a line to deliver at the beginning of the date. He says, you know, I, look, the scripted line, very clearly. He said, you said that you felt overlooked and I want you to know that in my eyes, you would never be overlooked. <laughs> Will you go to the prom with me? Like it was like this like- <laughs> Like a robot like, talking. Yeah, and I feel like he's gotten like so much help from this show. <laughs> like this show has helped him so much because he has done, as you said, kind of nothing. Like he's not, he's not charismatic. Like he's not, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't give it to the camera, as you said. I know, it's confusing. It's it also suggests to me that she really likes him. And so the producers have had to help him a lot to like give him a storyline because otherwise there's there's not a lot there. But what you just said also, I hadn't thought about this before. Since they didn't actually go to anyone's hometown, I wonder how they chose like each person's date. Like <laughs> Joe's was obviously, you know, play into they're both from Minneapolis, the high school thing, like their hometown connection. And I guess, you know, Nate, Nate does seem to uh, paddleboard a lot. I saw that on his Instagram. Okay. But, <laughs> but you can't, I can't imagine Rodney was like, Hey, I love that. I've been identified as the apple guy the whole season. Let's go apple picking. 
Yeah, no. That <laughs> didn't seem... Well, that's the other thing, too. And then, like, with um, with Michelle talking about this date with Joe, she says things like, this is the sweetest thing anyone's ever done for me. And I'm like, Joe didn't do this. I know. Like, there's 0% chance that Joe did any of this. <laughs> like, so, like, the idea that she's like, this is the sweetest thing anyone's ever done for me. I'm like, you mean the producers? The producers have done the sweetest thing for you anyone's ever done for you? Like, what? She knows that, right? Like, we all know that? I don't know. I mean, she I, has to. Cynical? She's, been on, she's been on the <laughs> other side of it, right? So she has to know. But, I mean, if she doesn't know, it's bizarre. I, I do think she is doing it. She's just playing along. Like, I think she must have yeah. decided before the season, like, she was going to play a certain way. And that's, like, super straight, su- super uh, earnest. And, frankly, that's why I think the season's been a little boring. Right. That's kind yeah, of Yeah, that's probably, it's probably true. The yeah, in the room with the season. She's wonderful. Which She's wonderful. Yeah, I have no problems with her. You know, what's interesting is that what I love about like this point in the season, though, more than this is this is the part of the season that I start loving the most, like right around here, hometowns into the end. Because then I'm like really hyper paying attention to like how the lead is just looks and like is acting around these suitors. Because it's like, I'm kind of like, okay, like. Who is she pretending to be into because the show needs her to or something, right? right. Or like, is she genuinely falling in love with four people? Because you just think, I guess that's possible. Like, of course that's possible. I see myself being in that situation. But you can sometimes like see kind of cracks in the veneer, like where you kind of like can tell like body language stuff about how they're really feeling about someone. And I genuinely felt that she was super into all four of these people, which means either that she's like, really good at this. And that means she's basically a psychopath who can like lie to people and pretend to be in love with them for the sake of an entertainment. (laughs) Or she's really, really falling in love with four people, which is an incredibly fascinating thing to watch someone deal with on television. So yeah, this is the, this is the time for me. This is when it's getting interesting, even though I do think the seasons lacked a little in the drama department. Totally. Do you think she was legitimately falling in love with Rodney? Like what, when you were watching their date, like, did you see those cracks that you were referring to? I felt no, I didn't. I that's why I was so upset when she said to Malum. <laughs> because you know, and then like watching him say, like, you know, I am falling in love with you, like that hit her like a ton of bricks. And you know, know, that might just be because you feel bad because you've hurt this person, or it might be because, you know, maybe you feel like you've made a mistake, but I don't know. What do you think about that? Do you think she felt like she made a mistake or do you think she just felt bad that she hurt him and he's so I wonderful? think she felt bad that, that she hurt him. I thought her yeah. goodbye with him was so sweet and mature. And it was. Real, and really kind, ultimately. She seems like a really kind person. They were both person. so kind. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree. And these guys yeah. seem kind to me, you know, really. I know. Except for Nate, who I'm... I, Except for Nate. I, I just don't trust that guy. Me neither. <laughs> trust him for a second. Me neither, and that's why I would pick him. I would be like, I'm going to solve this puzzle, which is people are, I know people are so different, but like for me, like Joe is so beautiful that like, I, I, I would put up with whatever if he was just looking at me, like, I'd be like, Oh, well, I mean, yeah, sure. He doesn't know his feelings. He's never been in love. And like, he's never had a girlfriend, whatever, but look at him. He's such a wonderful person. I would say to myself, he has a real, like, um, What's the word I'm thinking of? He's got a real sort of, it's not like genuineness, but sort of like a gentle quality to him that I also think is like disarming because he's so hot. You would find him, you would expect him to like be like more brash or something, but he doesn't have that. I don't, I don't know. He, he's like, he's got the looks of an alpha and like the presence of a beta. And I, that sounds really <laughs> negative, but I don't mean it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, 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 she described him as having kind of a quiet confidence, which I get. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He just looks so good in clothes. He it's just looks insane. so good in clothes. <laughs> I'm sure he looks good not in clothes. He just looks really good. What could I say? <laughs> he really does. He really does look so hot. Um, in general, do you like have you been enjoying this run? Like, I feel like when when were you on during Matt's season? Is that when we first potted together? No, it was or during Katie's season. Um, Katie season. Yeah. Pat, oh my god, have you been following the Katie drama? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is what I really love also about the French. It's like the other thing. Okay. There's the kind of like hot people making out in various stages of undress part, but there's also just like the endless gossip, like the endless gossip. It's cycle. pretty crazy. It's actually like in- insane. It's, 
it's gotten to a different level. I mean, with John going on to Reddit and like doing a long screed, it's just like, where are we as a society, let alone as Bachelor Nation? It's I know. Kind of- It's kind of like morphing out of control. Like even like Ashley and Jared, like they feel like really quaint and like old timey (laughs) compared to like some of these new new relationships. It's it's kind of strange. I don't know. I feel like we're like watching some generational shift before our eyes with all. I think we are happening. It's funny that you brought up Ashley I because I always think of Chris Souls' season as being a real turning point in like the kind of overall existence of this franchise because I feel like. Caitlin Bristow and Ashley Iaconetti came on Chris Souls' season and they were kind of like more savvy and more ready mm-hmm. to like make a career out of this than anyone I had seen before. Right. And I felt like from that point on, it was like, okay, like we're in this new era where it's the right point. reasons thing is like still very important and we're all going to talk about the right reasons. But like, we all also know that there is a career path here and like yeah, that's in, absolutely. The, in the room. Absolutely. And there wasn't and a career path early on. What career path was there for you if you went on The Bachelor in the year 2002? You hope to get like an HGTV show like Jillian Harris um, or you. Yeah, I mean, that, that's not even 2002. That's like what, 2010? I mean, it's later. Yeah. I mean, all of the people from 02, from like 02 to 10, they're kind of like out of the consciousness or they're Jesse Palmer and they'll be hosting. I would assume so. it was. <laughs> I would assume it would be bad for their career, largely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I don't totally. know. And this is something else. I, I I feel like this now. What you're pointing at, like, and this has been like for me since like since about Claire, since around the Claire. Claire broke the Bachelor. <laughs> yes, one hundred percent. This is this is my this is my theory. Claire actually broke the Bachelor, and like we are living in the broken era now. Like, what is going on? <laughs> like, everything is haywire. <laughs> There's t- two seasons of The Bachelorette back to back. They announced Clayton like before Michelle's <laughs> season even started. Like, what? So weird. What is happening? And the gossip cycles are so out of control and so constant that it's just like, yeah, it's just total chaos now. This reminds me. I forgot to tell you that I saw. I met Dale at a documentary party. I saw I saw your picture. <laughs> Wait, what was the document? You were at a documentary party? Yes. It was like the reception for um the doc NYC film The First Wave and he was just there because he's friends with the filmmaker. He was there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. He's friends with the director, Matt yeah. Heineman? Yes. Is friends yeah. with Dale? Yeah, they met on a beach in the Caribbean. That's what Dale told me. <laughs> Penny Lane is shocked right now. <laughs> this is not like an overlap that I ever imagined in a million years. I saw that you posted a picture with Dale. I assumed it was at like a bachelor kind of no. thing. No, it was at the reception just, for the premiere just, you know, of the first wave. Be, just to be clear, the first wave is like a super intense, depressing film about hospital workers in the early stages of COVID. I'm just trying it's to like so set har- the scene it's so for harrowing. how harrowing <laughs> and dark and hor- and like really intense. And so that's the party where you met Dale. Yes. Yeah. I saw him come in. He was the tallest person in the room, obviously. And I made a beeline for him. And I was like, well, I have to introduce myself. I did. He was very gracious and it was shocking. But like, just to your point, like Dale's thriving as like a former bachelor person. And as you mentioned, Chris's soul's season. And by the way, I'll just say Dale said he's like not doing bachelor stuff, but like here I am talking about him on a bachelor podcast. Like he's still relevant, but on Chris soul season, Becca Tilly, who came in second, she's a podcaster. Caitlin Bristow came in third. She's a podcaster. Jade Roper came in fourth. She's a podcaster. Ashley Iconetti famously left on the two on one. She's a podcaster. Like these people were actually trailblazers. Like, and now, you know, obviously as we were on this podcast, this, the bachelor podcasting Instagram influencer world is vast. And it did really turn with Chris souls this season. You're absolutely right. And it's like kind of crazy to look back on. I think a lot of people don't even know that Becca Tilly is from the bachelor. I think they just think she was like, Oh yeah. Podcast. So. I was going to say, like, I heard this, um, it was actually on, I think it was on, I can't remember now if it was on Caitlin's podcast or on Ashley's podcast, but on one of them, the two of them were talking about that season and Ashley and Caitlin bonded over the fact that when they arrived on set to be on The Bachelor, they both felt like this is where I am meant to be. Like, this is like, you know, and they both <laughs> That's like- a terrifying called- instinct. <laughs> 
<laughs> they both like called their mom and were like, I don't know how to explain it, but like, this is where I'm meant to be. And they like, they like met each other and bonded over this. And they also bonded over their like shared sense that you could leverage this to have like a media career. Like Ashley A. Kennedy went to communication school at Syracuse, like a really good yeah. journalism Newhouse. program. Yeah, she went to the Newhouse school. And she was telling her professors like, I'm going to do The Bachelor, and that's the way it's going to go. And they were like, what are you talking about? So, like, basically, I don't know what game the young people are playing now. Like, I'm just, like, I'm confused. Well, I don't understand. And then you look at, like, Nate and Joe, and I'm just like, are they playing this game to get famous? Like, it doesn't it – definitely not with Joe. And definitely does not feel that way with Rodney either. Nate, I could see maybe being interested in, in some fame. I do think Nate – um, conversation with his stepfather was really genuine and his emotion seemed really, really genuine. I do think also like after six or seven weeks in this like sensory deprivation tank that is filming the show, like you probably are prone to extreme emotion. And so I don't want to, I don't want to question that. I, I thought that was a genuinely like really beautiful moving conversation. And Callie and I mentioned this, but like the kind of the different family setups they showed this week was also really nice and different for the show. And you know, we kind of asked the question of like, sh- is, is having a final four men of color and all these different kinds of families, like, is that progress for the show? And like, is that like good job for the show? It's kind of irrelevant, like whether it's a like, good job. Like, I think I don't really want to give them too much credit, but I, I do think there's like something I found something genuinely moving and seeing like all these different types of families in like the sort of the messaging that like, you know, just because someone is not like your biological parent or because you don't all look exactly the same doesn't mean that your family has more or less than something else. So I I did think that was like genuinely moving. Um, Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Visible. Maybe you've already let your New Year's resolution slip. We all have, but you can still make a two year's resolution with Visible. Right now, you can get a one line wireless plan from Visible for just $20 per month for 24 months. 24 months is basically four bachelor seasons. That could be four engagements, four broken engagements. So many other couples we didn't see them coming. It's really an eternity in Bachelor Nation. And that's unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon with no annual contracts. Switch now at Visible.com and use the code Visible24. Don't miss out. Offer ends January 31st. New members only. Promotional rate with service on the Visible plan. For additional terms and network management practices, see Visible.com. This episode is brought to you by eBay Authenticity Guarantee. eBay knows that when it comes to jewelry, authenticity is the real gem. When you see the blue check mark that says Authenticity Guarantee, it means your next piece will be carefully inspired by jewelry experts and will always be worth its weight in gold. Whether you're looking to make a statement or build the perfect everyday look, eBay is making sure you get the real deal. With eBay Authenticity Guarantee, you can trust that jaw-dropping piece will always arrive jaw-droppingly real. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal. Visit ebay.com for terms. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. But that said, I also was like, I don't know about Nate. I think he's having some real emotion. But I, and I again, I would pick Nate, but I would be worried that he wasn't there for the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe a little not. So so what do we think? Like, is it Joe? I feel like it's Joe. I feel like it's I been it's Joe Nate. all along. It was Joe before she ever got on the show. It was Joe when he ghosted her on Instagram three years ago. For some reason, I keep thinking about WandaVision in this conversation. Like the way that you're talking about how like the... <sighs> The, the Bachelor world is broken. I'm sort of like, are we inside of like the Wanda simulation version of The Bachelor? And you just said, jo- Joe, Joe, yeah, there's along. something like <laughs> just, just so crazy. Yeah, exactly. There's something it's so Joe along, out of time. Along. Yes, exactly. So, it's like, yeah, it's exactly it, right. <laughs> it's like we're inside a Bachelor simulation right now. Wait, I do think that reality TV, and this is a good transition into Selling Sunset, which I would love to discuss with you. I do feel, we, and I know that you generally love reality TV or at least have an academic interest in it. We love it. <laughs> it's okay. We- I love it. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also I also have an academic interest in it. And um, I would say even a philosophical interest in it, but largely it's just like garbage that I'm putting in my face. Like it's right. It's fun. And I think I enjoy that. <laughs> I think that perfectly describes Selling Sunset, which I want to say 
is an objectively bad show. Like if you had to watch it week over week, would you watch? Oh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, as opposed to it being dropped all in one. You just no, I it. would not. No, because it's 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 honestly, and this is so stupid to say, but it feels so forced. It feels so contrived. Like it's like kind of like the dramas are so obviously set up. Like this whole thing with the Emma, the new person, and they're like, this thing happened a few years ago. You know, it's just like so set up and contrived. Um, but I do enjoy all those people. But no, I don't think I'd watch it if I had to wait a week between every episode. It's more like a shove it in your face kind of and then you're done. Thing. I, I'm sorry. I'm just in shock because you said you enjoy all of them. Do you actually like would you who would you most want to go out for coffee with of this group? Of OK, people? I don't think of them like that. Juliet. I'm not <laughs> saying that I want to be friends with them or that I respect them or whatever. I'm saying I have a very this is the problem. Like the standard for a reality television character is not the same standard that we saw this with uh, President Tom Trump who was a great reality TV character, like truly one of the greatest, like as the guy on The Apprentice, he was like a a crazy lunatic and that like worked, but then you're not supposed to like, like those same things in a real person. Anyway, so no, I don't want to hang out with any of them. Who would I want to hang, who would I, if I had to have coffee with someone, I suppose Chriselle. Interesting. I I think it's obviously Maya. Maya seems by far the most normal to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fair. (laughs) <laughs> I would choose Maya one. I mean, Chriselle and Mary and Heather, their mean girl turn this season was kind of shocking to me. I was like, is it? Yeah. And and then by the end of this season, at first I was like, oh, this just must be played up for television. But then I have to say this show, I think is largely bad. However, the series finale, the se- season finale was shocking. I was, I was like the way that Mary yelled at Christine and the mm-hmm. way that Heather stormed off and was like, the cameras are on. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. I was like, what the fuck did she actually do to them? I was just like, <laughs> similar I to know. Joe. I was just like, wait, they do really hate her. And it's like rage. Yeah. 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 And where are you? The saying, rage like, was building. The rage was building that. Like I was like, that was my favorite storyline, actually. It was just watching like Christine like finally force the reaction out of everyone that she was like trying to get. She's uh, she's like, again, she's a perf she's Donald Trump. Like Christine is like Donald Trump. Christine is a perfect person for reality television. She will say anything, she'll make up any story. She's clearly has no investment in telling the truth about anything. Like she doesn't care. So she's just like, what's a good story I can tell, you know? Um, yeah. That whole, again, that whole thing with Emma was so clearly just kind of hallucinated by her. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, he he also proposed to me. And you're like, oh, no one, that, clearly none of your friends think that that happened. So it probably didn't. Anyway, so I think she's just like a perfect reality TV character. She's like, um, who's the one on um, Real Housewives of Salt Lake City? Jen. Jen. Oh my God. She's a gen, right? Like it's these, it's these people that are like so good at this. And I genuinely think it's not a good sign for their like humanity at all. No. Like to be really good at reality TV is like not to be a good person. It just isn't. I think that, I think that Christine seems genuinely evil. Like I, I think that there's, there's been a lot of conversation about her and her storyline. Um, the thing that seems to be getting a lot of traction on the internet is that, you know, she had this traumatic uh, emergency C-section that she discusses. I think that's like an episode two or three. Um, it sounded uh, really traumatic and, and I'm glad she and her child are okay. And then two weeks later, allegedly the timeline is fuzzy on the show, but she like claims that she's doing like Pilates and yoga two weeks later, which I have not had a C-section. I have had abdominal <laughs> surgery you are not able to use your core muscles in any meaningful way for like, and in fact, you, you're not allowed to like after I had abdominal surgery, I couldn't lift anything more than five pounds for two months. So there's, there's some like false information there. And a lot of women have sort of pointed out those sort of like the, the both a a physical, but really emotional harm of like suggesting that someone who goes through a C-section like that could be doing that kind of physical exercise and have, that body so shortly thereafter um it's led to some uh, honestly theories. like the fa- the f- i was gonna say like i have not seen said conspiracy theories but i didn't i had the thought like is she wearing a fake pregnancy yeah. belly 
did did she have a surrogate? <laughs> like, did this woman actually give birth? Because like, yeah, maybe that timeline's weird, but like, I don't know a lot. I've never had a baby, but like, can, can that, that's what I was thinking. And I'm glad you brought up the abdominal surgery part. I hadn't thought about that. I was just more like, how do you get to that state of fit? Yeah. I mean, quickly? I think for any kind of after birth, for, I mean, again, I haven't had a child either, but I, like I said, I have had abdominal surgery from what I've heard from friends, you, you know, getting back into shape, I think is in, or not even back into shape, but like losing weight is different for every woman, first of all. So like some people go back, some people don't. Um, but I did have abdominal surgery and I was not allowed to do anything. And also you're in so much pain. It like hurts the walk, like abdominal surgery of any kind, C-section, whatever is no joke. And so I do like I, it makes me it makes me hate Christine for implying that, that could be true. I also just want to say I deep dived her Instagram. I do not believe she faked her pregnancy. OK, a lot, a lot of pregnancy shots, a lot of glamour, like hair covering her boobs like. Oh, but you, know. you see the belly. You don't think yeah. it looks like a fake belly. I don't. Did, so then so then she's lying about the emergency C-section or or the timelines. But I'm, I actually think the timeline is probably. Or the timeline is just so, I see. Okay. So then on the show, when they're all saying, it's only been two weeks. That's my take. I think that's just a lie. Because, so the creator of the show is Adam DeVello, who actually interviewed on Bachelor Party. He he, um, co-created The Hills, Laguna Beach. And, you know, that show famously, like, fudged timelines, storylines, et cetera. And this is so derivative of The Hills. I mean, if you watch The Hills, this is very, very familiar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's go back to the, to the, love triangle that is like it's like the invisible love triangle wait what do you well, wait, hold, hold on a second i'm just gonna say like the thing that i think is interesting about being so embedded in so many different reality franchises and like kind of just learning about them and you know sort of noticing things over the years is that there's a kind of idea that people have that it's like well reality tv producers are this way or like right. they do this kind of manipulation but not that kind of manipulation and the reality is that that's changing constantly with every franchise But it's also very different across franchises. Like what the Bravo people do is very, probably very different, like in terms of whatever their internal code of conduct is. (laughs) Or like, maybe that's putting it a little strongly, but like their internal ethics, really different than like what you would do on ABC, which is different than what you would do on like, you know, USA or like whatever. (laughs) USA. Great point. (laughs) Um, USA has Chris Lee knows best though, I think, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but that no, that is really a point. I was I was trying to think like where is like freeform, I think has some too. Like I feel like there's a lot of reality That's, franchises out there. There's so a much, lot of but your point is right. And I bet that some of your films are like this too. It's like each show is like a closed circuit and sort of like its own it's like its its own world essentially. And they have, like you said, you're their dealing own code of with contact. your and you're dealing with your own like like specific storytelling problems that have emerged from a specific production situation. Like yeah. you're going to have problems that you have to deal with or like there'll be different things you have to do to like make a story that makes sense. Right. And so, yeah, you're right. It's very contingent um, on on all the details of what's going on in that particular show. Yeah. And I think that this show, I mean, also it's kind of similar to Vanderpump in that Vanderpump uh, Sir has like you know, tens of people that work there and you see like 10 of them on the show. The Oppenheim group has like a lot of agents and there's no way that Jason could be like, Hey, I decided to sign a lease and Oh, this, the staff is here, but no one knew. Like there's so many things that are so contrived. That's what I mean. Like, I, and that makes me nuts. Like, I, I, I don't mind it. Like, I get it. Like, we're, I, we understand what we're watching, but I really want you to do better at fooling yeah. me. Yeah, that's exactly. what I. That's what I want. Like, I feel that I'm a sophisticated viewer, and I would like for you to operate at a really high level of manipulation, so that, like, I genuinely think it's possible that Chriselle could have wanted that home that Jason happened to have a buyer to, for. Yeah, have another buyer for. <laughs> yeah, I know. To- makes no sense at all. Um, but. The other thing that I was really just sort of like taken by was the way they're setting up this extended world. And then we'll come back to the the invisible love triangle. But at the end, you know, so selling Tampa is coming on December 15th. And then clearly selling OC is coming based on how they ended this series, this season. I keep saying series like it's British. Um, and so I, uh, you know, we just have so much more of this coming our way, which, you know, as a binge, I accept. That's good. 
I, I'm sure I, I'm sure that I'll watch them. I mean, like, as you said, as a binge, it's like a Sunday thing. It's like, okay, yeah. it's Sunday. I'm doing housework. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was I did a jigsaw puzzle while watching a lot of this. I was like, okay, this is a good background noise for me. Um, let's talk about the love triangle. Christine, you know you're in trouble when not even Davina will take your side. I mean, Davina <laughs> is like is like Lucifer incarnate. And so she doesn't even believe this shit. I mean, <laughs> Do you think Christine believes that she was engaged, that she got proposed to by this guy? Great question. Um, <laughs> because I think that this is part of what it takes to be great at reality TV. Like, I think that you need to be able to lie and then believe it because that's how you like act. Yeah. Like in a way yeah. that is convincing. Gotta believe the story. Yeah. So do yeah. you think and that so she believes you, it? I guess I would say it's very possible. Um, but, but, it, but that, 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 that doesn't make her a good person. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, she's either, so, you know, you, we've all known people that have problems with like the truth or reality, sure. right? You know, like sure, just sure. Are, yeah. there's, it's, a, it's a certain personality type that exists and maybe it's like one in 20 people that really seems to be able to believe just about anything kind of at any given moment. Like, and I yeah, do they're think called she, pathological she, liars. Yeah. <laughs> she's in, she's absolutely in that category. So has she convinced herself that this is true? Very possible. Yeah. Did totally she know possible. she was lying at the beginning? Of course she did. Of yeah, course she, she did. And it seems she's like so, she, she's so gleeful about it. Like, I, like, that's what gets me. It's like she really is enjoying herself. And that's kind of what makes it so fun to watch her. She seems like the producer probably like her the most because she is the most cooperative, basically. We'll do anything for them. I mean, clothes that she wears to walk her kid like to like you know push the stroller so shocking it's like not even Amazing. normal for LA like in LA people just wear like you know it's like sweats and like athleisure all the time and it's crazy so you're like a sm you know a lot more about the sort of economy of these shows than me so like is someone else paying for her clothes she's not buying those clothes right well she claims her husband's really rich I don't know I'm sure true. sure they are rich or maybe there are but but even then it would be like Really? I can't, I don't believe she's buying all that stuff. She must be wearing it and giving it back. Yeah, I think that's what, I think she's borrowing it. I think it's almost like paid promotion, right? But like, I, Chanel doesn't need her. Like, Gucci doesn't need her. So like, some of the like really high-end designer stuff, I don't believe is anything but her. Or I don't know how she's getting that. Consignment? I don't know. Fakes? <laughs> yeah, knockoffs. She, she couldn't do that. Um, We haven't talked about either of the new girls, Emma and Vanessa. Let's talk about let's talk about Emma for a second though. Emma, sure. it, my favorite moment of the season probably was um, when Emma was talking about her new uh, her new empanada flavors, <laughs> and <laughs> and she said there was cheeseburger and um, crab cake, I believe, and, and uh, what was the last pizza? one? Pizza, oh yeah, pizza and pizza, <laughs> and the reaction was hilarious first of all it does sound disgusting i mean no thank you at all <laughs> oh wait, wait didn't she i thought she said that they were vegan are they vegan i was they're trying vegan. to figure this so all, okay so they're it's, it's all like, so it's like a, oh right too. she does she's that's right she's doing it impossible she dropped the brand name yeah yeah exactly um so it turns out that her family is like in the packaged food business so okay. it's not like she just randomly got into this it was like you know it would be like if your child was like, oh, I want to start a podcast. You'd be like, okay, well, I know some people who can do that for you. No problem. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that there's like a, there's, you know, just more to her backstory. But then I also looked up who the guy is that they were both allegedly engaged to. His name oh. is Peter Cornell. Mm. And um, apparently he was on the Lakers, which I didn't know. Or I think oh. he was like barely on the Lakers, but somehow on it. I don't know. <laughs> um, did you think they were being too mean to Christine by the end? No. I mean, look, come on. <laughs> like this, Christine is like a walking provocation. Like she, her entire purpose on this franchise is to make people upset and angry. Yeah. And she's happy to do it. Like, again, there is always one person that's cast this way on every season, at least one. And they do it with relish. She loves being a villain, clearly. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the mean, the mean stuff was intense, but like, it was like sort of like, warranted you have to like look back at like all all the years of christine like pushing these people She's i mean, mean. Like, for me watching mary flip out when christine showed up at the dog party was my favorite part of the season because a there was a dog party it was a 
birthday party for dogs and B, Mary like losing her temper over that was so real. It was so real, I think. Like I don't think she was so upset. And I felt like very legit. Like it didn't feel like fake to me at all. It felt like she was like, come on, can't I have one thing (laughs) without this evil witch like ruining it? You know? Oh my God. It was that was so, so good. I mean, there's so much in this show. There is. Mary's husband. Husband yes. now, right? Romaine. Yeah. yeah, they're married. Okay. There's no way that his name is pronounced Romaine. No. Like the lettuce? No. It's like that's There's no be the, way. The American the Americanization <laughs> of it. He is French. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to pretend like I can do a good French accent because I can't. Me but neither. But there is a 0% chance that his name is Romaine. I and know. the fact that this woman is married to this man and calls well, him Romaine is even so when he, upsetting. When he introduced himself to Vanessa, or maybe it was to Emma, one of the new girls, he said it that like in the Americanized way too. Like we've, we've all gone, we've all lost our minds over this. It's not, it's not good. There's, there's so much. We haven't even talked about the houses. We haven't even talked about the celebrity cameos. I'm going to do all of that actually with um, my good friend, David Jacoby. So a lot more coming up. Who was that? I always mean, I always mean to look the celebrities up because I've never, I've never heard of any of them ever. Who, sure. who was the, who was the rapper whose like brother showed them around the house? Like who was that? French Montana. Thank you. Is he that a famous dated, person? Well, he once dated Khloe Kardashian. He is famous. I, yeah. I thought the celebrity cameos were so funny. I cannot believe Simu Liu was on the show. I, no Marvel star should be on this show. His, his Oh, he, I forgot about him. He's a yeah. shang Yeah, he, he, he needs to get new representation. Because we had <laughs> a, a lesso by name, French Montana via FaceTime, Thomas Bryant, who I accept because he's like probably like fourth tier fame in the NBA. And then Simu Liu, who's like world famous now, like just in the huge <laughs> movie, as Chriselle pointed out, is going to have so many more, uh, so many more movies. Like he's, he's in the Marvel world. Like he's, uh, he's set. So like, what is he doing? Like, did he think he would end up dating Chriselle? Like, I don't even know. It seemed a little bit like that energy was there initially, which, you know, is kind of, I guess, a big part of the selling sunset real estate brand. Yeah, I know. And that, uh, Jacoby and I are going to rank the houses, so I'm going to save that for later. But uh-huh. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but I, I thought that Simu Liu being on it was just like shocking. And also his he was very unrealistic. Getting a pool and a basketball court in the same <laughs> home in the Hollywood Hills, completely unrealistic. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I love how, like, sometimes, Juliet, you're like, this thing on this <laughs> show was unrealistic. Like, how do you pick well, and choose which ones to be? Because I feel about? like Simu Liu, <laughs> he was coming with his own expectations. And, like, that's, I, I don't think they told him what to say he was looking for. That probably okay. is his dream. But I wanted someone to tell him that, that that's your dream, live in the valley. <laughs> so... I don't know. The real estate's a whole a whole other thing. In general, I would have liked more real estate this season. It was too, it was too much of the Christine fighting. I would have liked more just sort of like randomness and like more like LA. Yeah, I get it. And you also always enjoy like people working. <laughs> so like to the extent True. that that is sort of like they're working, like I get it. I totally agree. There's always a burnout. There's always a burnout factor for me on the shows that are like the Real Housewives franchise is a good example. I mean, I love that franchise, but when when I feel like the balance is off and there's just way too much of like people screaming at each other, like I just I just check out. Like I get it. We need. Some, I agree. But it's just like Jersey. So I don't like yeah, Jersey. exactly. It was too always much too much and screaming. Fighting. Yeah, yeah. And like I get that that's part of the appeal of these programs, but like for me, it just like takes it a little too far sometimes. And inevitably, Selling Sunset does the same thing. It's like too much screaming. I know. I think that it's the perfect Netflix show. I, like we were saying, it's just like, it's meant to be taken all in at one time. It drops, you revisit it a couple times a year, but it's not a constant like The Bachelor or Housewives. Like it's sort of, um, it's in some ways the opposite of this like bizarro universe we're living in with The Bachelor where it's like a, it's like a trip to another dimension and then you leave, then you come home and you're like, back <laughs> yeah. to my regular scheduled programming. Whereas for whatever reason, The Bachelor franchise has invaded every aspect of our consciousness 24 yeah, hours exactly. a day. <laughs> and like all parts of like tabloid culture as well. So, And you went to a, once again, COVID documentary party. COVID documentary party where I saw Dale. It was thrilling, honestly. 
He was a nice was he guy. Great? Was he he great? was really nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't like feel like I need follow up. Like I'm good, but it was really nice to meet him. It was love, lovely guy. He was with like regular friends too. I will I will go to the mat in a sense for Claire forever. Like mm. I, I really think that in, in, someone asked me recently, what was your favorite season of The Bachelorette? And I was like, I actually believe that like the two episodes the that three Claire did. Claire. <laughs> I genuinely mean it. Like, I've rewatched it over and over. Like, her brand of crazy was just very interesting to me. And I, like, really loved watching her. I always loved watching her on TV. I thought she was always a scene stealer in every scene she was ever in. She was. She was great. Watching her have her star turn and then break The Bachelor was just the greatest thing I've ever seen. Totally. No, I totally agree with you. Like she, that was, that was like a fun few weeks. She did break the bachelor. It's legendary. I just hope she finds happiness. I think that she makes some bad choices. She like, she, you know, I would be like, Claire, I'd be making all the wrong choices, but I wish we've already covered this, but yes, I I definitely (laughs) relate to Claire's bad choices more than I relate to Michelle's bad choices. Like, well, she has, Michelle hasn't made them yet. Who do you think is going to win? You think it's Joe? I just assumed it was Joe, but who knows? I never know. Uh, I love I, this part. I don't usually I know love either. the ride. Yeah. <laughs> that's such a, that's so positive. Penny, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> um, I loved your ride uh, listening to Kenny G, HBO Max and HBO. Check it out. Uh, Penny, hope you'll come back again soon. And I love uh, that. Thanks to Erica Cervantes for producing this episode. And I'll be back with Callie on Tuesday. <laughs> 